Hello, for this video recording, we're going to be talking about homeostasis. The term homeostasis is used by physiologists to mean mainly that it's going to be the maintenance of nearly constant conditions in the internal environment, independent of what is happening in the external environment. Essentially, all organs and tissues of the body are going to perform functions that are going to help maintain these relatively constant conditions. Remember when we went over all the different organ system functions? If not, then go back and review module one, learning outcome number two, which covered the levels of body organization. Why do you think it is so important to maintain homeostasis, maintain this balance in the internal environment? Well, for the body to function optimally, all organ systems need to be doing their part properly. For instance, we talked about how the lungs provide oxygen to the extracellular fluid to replenish the oxygen used by the cells throughout the body. The kidneys are going to maintain a constant iron concentration, so they're going to regulate that. And the gastrointestinal system will provide the nutrients to all cells in all organ systems. Feedback loops are the processes that regulate homeostasis. There are two of these processes, one that's called the negative feedback loop and one that's called the positive feedback loop. Let's go over these in the next couple of slides. Like I mentioned on the previous slide from body temperature to blood pressure to levels of certain nutrients, each of these physiological conditions are going to have a particular set point. What is a particular set point? A set point is going to be the physiological value around which the normal range fluctuates. What is the normal range? The normal range is that restricted set of values that is optimally healthful and stable. So for example, the set point for a normal human body temperature is approximately 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Notice how I said approximately, because it's not a fixed temperature. It does fluctuate a little bit. It is common for these physiological parameters, such as body temperature and blood pressure, to fluctuate, of course, within a normal range, a few degrees above or a few degrees below that point. How does this process take place? Well, there are going to be control centers in the brain and other parts of the body that will monitor and react to these deviations or variations from the ideal homeostasis, which is by using the negative feedback. Therefore, we can say that negative feedback is going to be a mechanism that reverses a deviation from the set point. In other words, negative feedback is going to maintain these body parameters with their normal range. The maintenance of homeostasis by this process of negative feedback goes on throughout the body at all times. And an understanding of this negative feedback mechanism is going to be fundamental to an understanding of human physiology. Using the image, we can identify that a negative feedback system has three basic components, a sensor, a control center, and an effector. A sensor, also referred to as a receptor, is going to be a component of the feedback system that monitors a physiological value. So the sensor is in the lookout for anything that might be abnormal. This abnormal value is then reported to the control center, where the control center is the component in the feedback system that compares the value that was received from the sensor to the normal range that we talked about. If this value deviates too much from that set point, from the normal range, then the control center activates the next component of the negative feedback, which is defector. 
An effector is therefore going to be the component in a feedback system that causes a change to reverse the situation and return the value back to the normal range, which is going to take it back to homeostasis. In order to set the system in motion, a stimulus must drive a physiological parameter beyond its normal range, that is beyond homeostasis. This stimulus is heard between quotes, in other words, by a specific sensor. So we can say that for every stimulus, there will be a specific sensor for it, like an expert of that information that will analyze it and realize that this physiological parameter is deviating from homeostasis. For example, in the control of blood glucose, specific endocrine cells in the pancreas are going to detect excess glucose in the bloodstream. So the excess glucose is going to be the stimulus. And the endocrine cells are the specific sensors. These pancreatic beta cells are going to respond to this increased level of blood glucose by releasing the hormone insulin into the bloodstream. So the insulin is going to therefore signal to the skeletal muscle fibers, the fat cells, and liver cells to take up excess glucose, removing it from the bloodstream. Therefore, we can say that the skeletal muscle fibers, the fat cells, the liver cells will be the effectors of this process, will be the ones that will take action to return these levels to normal. As glucose concentration in the bloodstream drops, then the decrease in concentration, the actual negative feedback, is going to be detected by pancreatic alpha cells and, and insulin release stops. This prevents the blood sugar levels from continuing to drop below the normal range. Humans have a similar temperature regulation feedback system that works by promoting either heat loss or heat gain. When the brain's temperature regulation center receives data from the sensors indicating that the body's temperature exceeds the normal range, then it's going to stimulate a cluster of brain cells that are commonly referred to as the heat loss center. Now this stimulation has three major effects, which we're gonna see now on this image. To activate this negative feedback loop, the first thing that needs to happen is for us to have a stimulus. In this case, the stimulus is going to be an increase in body temperature. Then it's going to activate either cells in the skin or in the brain. First, let's talk about the cells in the skin. Blood vessels in the skin they're gonna to begin to dilate, and this will allow more blood from the body core to flow to the surface of the skin, allowing the heat to radiate into the environment. It makes sense, right? So if you're dilating the blood vessel, it means that there's more space, so there's more blood circulating, and once it gets to the surface, it's able to exchange that heat with the environment. As the blood flow to the skin increases, then sweat glands are going to get activated to increase their output. So you're going to start to sweat more. As the sweat evaporates from the skin surface into the surrounding air, it's going to take the heat with it. Another event that can occur to reduce the body temperature is to increase the respiration. So a person, instead of breathing through the nose, it will begin to breathe through the mouth. And this is important because it's also a mechanism to increase heat loss from the lungs. In contrast, for example, if the body is losing too much heat, it will activate this brain area that's called the heat gain center. And this exposure to the coldness will redirect the blood flow from the limbs to deeper veins. And so if it's going to deeper veins, then it cannot exchange heat with the environment and therefore that heat stays in the body. So there are several different mechanisms that can occur to make sure that the body stays in homeostasis 
And the reason why it's called negative feedback is because it's trying to remove the stimulus that is causing the changes in homeostasis. Even though most control systems of the body act by negative feedback system, some do act through the positive feedback mechanism. So the positive feedback is going to intensify a change in the body's physiological condition rather than reversing it. That's why it's called the positive feedback loop. A deviation from the normal range will result in more change and the system will move farther away from the normal range. Remember that this is the total opposite of what happens in the negative feedback loop where more away from the normal range is definitely a no-no. I am sure that you would agree with this, right? Because the negative feedback loop, it tries to do everything that it can to get it back to the normal range. In this case, the positive feedback loop in the body is normal only when there is a definite endpoint. In other words, only when your body knows that this process that activated the positive feedback response will end. And once it does, it will go back to homeostasis. Childbirth and the body's response to blood loss are two examples of positive feedback loops that are normal but are activated only when needed. Childbirth at full term is an example of a situation in which the maintenance of the existing body state is not desired. Right? So like, who wants to remain pregnant indefinitely? Even a full nine months is very hard for most women. Think about all the changes that is required in a person's body to expel the baby at the end of pregnancy. The initiation of the positive feedback loop being activated is when you have extreme muscular contraction during labor and the delivery would be the end result of this process. So it has an end date, like a positive feedback loop needs to have, right? It has to have a point where it will terminate, and that's it. So it goes through all these changes, makes it even more aggressive to be able to cause an end to the process. Remember that for us to initiate a feedback loop, the first thing that needs to occur is a stimulus. In case of childbirth, the stimulus would be the first contractions of labor that will help to push the baby towards the cervix. And the cervix would be the lower part of the uterus, which is this area right over here. In return, the cervix will contain stretch sensitive nerve cells that monitor the degree of stretching. And guess what? The stretch sensitive nerve cells will be the sensors. So we have the stimulus, which are the first contractions of labor. We have the sensors, which are these stretch sensitive nerve cells. And now we're missing the control centers and the effectors. The control centers will be the brain where this information is going to be processed. In this case, these nerve cells will then send a message to the brain, which is the control center, which in turn causes the pituitary gland, which is located at the base of the brain, to release a specific hormone, which is called oxytocin, into the bloodstream. Oxytocin will cause even stronger contractions of the smooth muscle of the uterus, which is going to be the effector. So the effector is the one that will push the positive feedback loop to an end. So it's going to push the baby further down the birth canal. This causes an even greater stretching of the cervix, the cycle of stretching, oxytocin release, and, and increasingly more forceful contraction stops only when the baby is born. And then at this point, the stretching of the cervix comes to an end and it stops the release of oxytocin, closing your positive feedback loop.